All right, so let's rock and roll. What do you guys we, want? We are so, we're so hey, excited to have you. I don't, you, know, with you don't me, need them. Anything you, you don't, want to You don't need them. They're for us. Need, okay. Oh, don't worry. You can no, if you want. You can if you want. No, I'm good. Let's go. Um, first of all. Is this all, audio and video or just audio? Both. It's both. both. Okay, yeah. good. Where's the cameras? There we go. One. All over the room. Just one? Yeah. Okay. First okay. of all, I took your advice. I went to Sunny at uh, Pete's Golf. I'm all set up. Oh, he's season. doing oh. it. He's doing it. I got the irons. You got to come play with me this summer. I'm going to play. One of my courses. They just okay. called me, call me from uh, Mineola. They said the driver's in. Oh, great. So I'm done. Great. I'm hey, done. that's it. That's the place. Pete's Golf is the best. So, so I went in there. I said, I'm, I said I'm, a fr I'm a friend of Mike's. They go, Mike, Mike? I go, yeah. Yeah. Who, who, yeah. <laughs> no, Michael done. Bloomberg. Yeah. I said, I said, I'm a friend of Mike's. He, he said, if I'm going to start golfing again, I have to come to Sonny. Yep. And Sonny came out of the back and he's like, when you know, when you want to swing, it was awesome. It's, it's great. great experience. It's yeah. great. It's great. And it's just a little dumpy place on Jericho Turnpike, as you saw. Well, I went but, to both. The hey, one in Roslyn, too. Yeah. And they yeah. make a fortune. Oh yeah, they make a fortune. Uh, they're, yeah. they're super nice guys. Because people will spend anything on golf clubs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they'll spend anything. But when you're ready, call me and you come out and play with me one morning. Yeah, let me play. Let me okay. play like five, six times Go first, ahead. and, and come just out like and play. get because it's, it's been a, it's been a minute. You That's know? it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I'm, hey, you want to click us up? Yeah. All right, click John. Thank you. Clickety clack. Here we go. Back, All right, friends. Special episode with the goat. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Compound and Friends. My name is Downtown Josh Brown. I'm here with Michael Batnick, as always. Michael, say hello to the folks. Hello, hello. Wait, hit that button. Hit it. Hit Mike's button. Uh, Mike, do you know we have you as a drop? Oh, you do. Yeah. Wait, let me hear. Everywhere. Oh, oh, he can't hear. Oh, oh, here we go. Play it again. Go ahead. Hold on. Hold on. Ready? Yep. Hold on. Just one. He can't hear. It's too much. Turn All my right. mic on. There we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that guy still works for me, uh, Steve Afria, who he had a habit, and it's it's a funny thing because everyone still uses that bite. He liked to ride my mic, if you know what that means. Basically, it's a technician who thinks he can time and turn you up and down in between when you're talking on a two-man show, okay? Well, he was awful at it, and half the time, my <laughs> mic's still dead. So about the fifth time, I said to him, like, you're on a commercial, Steve, I love you. Don't ride my mic. Don't ride my mic. Finally, I said, turn my mic on. Yeah. And it, obviously, it's been around for like 100 years. It's so. one of the great. Yes. It's one of the Wait, great. I yes. thought that was when you were with Tiki. Was that was that something different? It was at a remote. So it was a lot of people. Okay. It was at a remote where I did it, where he was in the back of the room. So I yelled. It was actually at a, I think at one of our uh, real big charity events where I did it. So uh, the I irony. A good spot. I don't know where you stand with Tiki, but the irony of him giving Saquon shit for bailing on the oh, team. Tiki. That <laughs> Come was on. not a great day. Tiki's take sometimes a little weird. I mean, they, they, Tiki is very good at getting himself into hot water with the Giant fans. I mean, he really is amazing. I at used it. to love the guy. Oh, he's a, and he was a terrific player. Watching him play, he was my favorite player and before he let away. He's the classiest watch. individual you will ever meet. He is the nicest guy, and he's a classy guy. And he was one of the few players who went from being okay to great. Very few players ever do that. He came in the league, he didn't really Palmer have a role. Turner. What? He was a punt returner. He, and, and he didn't have a role, and then he was a fumbler. And he became- I remember the fumbles. Yeah. He be, when Coughlin got him to do high and tight, high and tight, he became one of the great running backs over that period of time in the history of the NFL. He and, was and Rondé was one of the better players at his position. Hall of Famer. Right, yeah. and, oh, Rondé was always great. And the thing is, Tiki did not like Tom Coughlin. It was not a secret, okay? Yeah. He saved Tom's job in Washington, and then Tom obviously goes on to win two Super Bowls after Tiki's gone, which is really ironic. When well, it, Tom, was, Tom was tough. Tom was tough, and he was inflexible, and give Tom credit, because he changed. He became, he was always tough, disciplinarian, and a great football coach, but he became flexible. He said, I understand okay, tell me what I have to change. And he changed. So yeah. give him credit because a lot of people can't change. Tom did. You're yeah. so right about Tiki going from good to great. I've never seen that before. Very rare. And the way that he Very ended rare. his career, remember against the Redskins that oh, game and then the Raiders? He had, just monster. I think he had 1,500 hey, he, yards he, one season. He used to get 200, 250 yard games. Yeah, he was yeah, great. Yeah. We are so happy to have you. I wanted to My ask pleasure you. To be here. I wanted to ask you about your new show versus um, the show that made you famous. But before we do that, we really want to give you like an introduction to the audience that's not necessarily from New York or hasn't at some point been uh, 
you know, heard, heard you or, for the or people seen you living action. under a rock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the people living under a rock, you are in many ways like the originator um, of a lot of things. But broadcast radio, talk radio, there's almost nothing that exists today that would exist in its present form had it not been for the stuff that you had been doing really for, I don't know, 40 years. Um, do you do you feel like people that you interact with understand that? Yes, or? I think I've been given I know a you get great a lot of deal of credit. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I get called, you know, all wonderful things. I'm in a lot of Hall of Fames, you know, the, the goal of the Pope. This. The and, you know, Dog and I were in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And that's always a very important thing. We got a chance to be the people who broke through and changed everything. And Mike and the Mad Dog changed everything. It changed everything. It changed things into a two-man or multiple-man show, which it used to be. Sports Talk used to be on at night, never during the day. It wasn't a prime time of thing. And it was a guy with a kazoo or a whistle and, you know, did some scores, took some calls, did some trivia, and it was out. We changed all that. And what we really are most proud of is people go to school now to be sports talk show hosts. When we started, they said, you guys are the gutter of sports media. Now we are the guys in every city. It's no longer a columnist. It's now the talk show host show. in that town yeah. who is the guy who sets the trend, who is the guy who, who is the message, who has to be heard, who changes every opinion. That is what changed. And uh, that's the thing I'm proudest of. And yes, I mean, I've gone to the Super Bowl and felt it from I have people come up to me and say, that's the thing I hear the most is this is why I got in the business. Yeah. You know, every, I hear that every day. Uh, this is why I got in the business. You're the reason I got in the business. I was in the back seat with my dad. Okay. Uh, I, I listened to you when I was eight years old. I wanted to go to school and learn how to do this. And, and listen, Mad Dog is a very big part of that. It was a two man show. It was a perfect blend. Uh, and there was enough edginess. See what made it work was we were two individuals who always felt we were better singles. That's funny. We, oh, and we were very successful alone. Does that sound and familiar? <laughs> it was very, there was, a, you two might have that. We had a ferocious rivalry. So we had great timing. We could work off each other like magic, but we also had this ferocious competition that lasted forever. And we did 20 years that way. And it created an edge to our show, which wasn't made up. It was real. It wasn't bullshit. No, it was real. A lot of those fights were real. A lot of those fights sometimes carried on during commercials. You know, people don't realize <laughs> we did it. In, and this was showed that we were good at this. And we were really good at this. We were, as a matter of fact, we were great. The best. This. We were the best. I, I, I admit that we were the best. The bottom line was we did not speak during a commercial or off the air for one year. No. And no one ever wrote a word of it or recognized it because when we were on the air, you didn't tell. Was there a proximate cause or it was just built up over it, years? It, it really had a, it, it, it built up, but it what really started it was my fault. Uh, I didn't want to go do a remote in Indiana. And Dog loved to do remotes. He, you could, Dog would do a remote in Timbuktu, okay? He loved doing remotes. For Didn't what? matter for, where for it was. For a Pacers game or? For a, play, a Pacer game. Okay. And when we got to the airport, our flight was canceled. Mm. And I'm like, I'm out of here. Our flight's canceled. I'm not waiting around four hours. Yeah. And I went back to the studio and he had to come back to the studio and he was furious. Why? Now, that you didn't stay at the airport and, and get the next flight? And wait for the flight. Okay. Right? So that was the coup de grace. As a matter of fact, when I, and this is true, and it's in the Mike and the Mad Dog uh, 30 for 30, and it's a true story. I got married in 2000 to my wife, Ro, and I said to her, when I left that year, I said, you guys decide. He's coming back or I'm coming back. We're not both coming back in yeah. September. So you pick, okay? You got all summer. I'm gone. I'm gone and he's gone. We're not going to work together all summer. We never worked together in July and August ever. And that was something else we did. We worked single. One was gone, one was there. Most shows shut down. We didn't shut down. We always worked alone. So our show was always covered. Uh, Base baseball season was really important to your show. You couldn't right. both be gone. No, July we were always there. So right. one of us was always there. But I said to them when I left, I said, decide. I said to Ro, I said, I'm not inviting him to the wedding. And she said, he's coming to the wedding. We were getting married in July. 
Yeah. So I don't, not invite him to the wedding. She said, well, I'm inviting him to the wedding. <laughs> she invited him to the wedding and we made up. If Wh- that women just know better. Happen, they just instinctually okay, know better. She saved Mike and the Mad Dog. Yeah. She really did. And it's a true story. And it's in the piece, but it's true. She's Without it, it would have been over. It was completely over. I was never working with him again. Who was your Mike Francis? I know how important Jim Nance was to you, but. Jim Nance, uh, I, I put it in stages. Nance, I broke Nance in to CBS into TV. I was there first. I worked for Musburger. They put me with Nance. I worked with Nance. Then I went on the air. Nance helped get me the job at FAN. I couldn't get the job. So they wouldn't give me even a chance to go in. He worked with a guy on a syndicated show who was a producer there named Luke Griffin, who he said, you got to give him a chance. They gave me a chance. They liked me. And next thing you know, I'm hosting Pete Franklin show when he's sick um, in afternoon drive. So Nance was a big part of it. Musburger, was the first one who said to me, you know the sports talk radio? You should go try it. This is right up your alley. I said, really? Because you were doing research for him. Right? I was his right hand, or so, uh, they called me his brain. Yeah. yeah, they called me Musburger's brain, which wasn't fair, because he was brilliant. He was really smart. But I was, everything came from me. I mean, everything. I was his information guy for every sport. And he did everything in those days. He was the monster anchor in those days. He was the guy. And they wanted to bring Nance in, so they did. And then when I got to radio, I learned a lot from Imus because Imus was really smart uh, about radio, about business. And Imus said to me, you know, when I was a kid, I was working for the Southern Pacific Railroad. He said, I was a teenager and he said, we had a terrible crash. He said, everybody called for a doctor, I called for a lawyer. <laughs> that was Imus. <laughs> and I learned a lot from Imus, how to negotiate contracts and do, uh, I learned a lot of, so those would be the three people who really influenced me. When you are doing your podcast now, what do you miss about radio or what do you like better in your current situation? Um, it's very different. But what I have set up with them, which is great, is I'm allowed to work whenever I want. So if I want to drag them down there at one o'clock in the morning, like I did last night, and work, I work. Oh, after, so, after, that, Nick, after that Nick's uh, OKC <laughs> game, it's incredible, right? I work whatever yeah. the event is. Yeah. You know, somebody will die. Or something like that. I really missed the callers. Sometimes I missed the callers, but I used to battle with the callers. Oh, See, yeah. My deal was this. <laughs> Here's what I always said. And people say to me, you're so mean to the callers. You know, what is wrong with you? Your attitude, you're so mean. To no, that. it was a love hate. And it's what I used to say. You guys don't get it. I said, I cherish the audience. I challenge the callers. Only about one and a half percent ever call. 99% yeah. or 98% never call. I cherish my audience. I've never not signed an autograph. I've never not been nice to them. But here's the deal. If you're going to call my show, it's like me standing out in the middle of the stage and you walk out Be ready. into my act. And if you're going to do that, you better bring something. So if you come out and have the audacity to come into my act <laughs> yeah. and you want to get involved, you better bring something that's worthwhile to this show, or what are you doing? What, so what did you I basically would more, kill them when they when they were bad. What did you dislike more? The person that just said, "Hey, uh, Mike, the Mets—they're going to win it all this year." It was that more annoying, or was it like somebody that just had a ridiculous take? The ridiculous take you could really play off. I was going to say, I feel like that would the be the boring guy. For you. They wouldn't give me because our guys were smart enough to okay. know how to screen because they'd get fired if they did that okay. stuff. All right. Our guys knew. We always directed calls. We always did calls thematically. We had a plan with calls. We weren't just putting up the next call. Okay, we didn't do that. Right. We had a plan with everything we did. Okay, everything was planned. Was thematic. Everything was planned, and a lot of things. We did sometimes to create, to start, you know, think, hey, dog, it's slow today. Follow my lead. Yeah. And we do something insane. Yeah. Okay. But you had or, listeners who knew how to get around the the guards, who would, like the jackass who said, oh, the Giants are in town. What about the Giants? Well, that cool the San game. Francisco you know, there, Giants, the New York Giants. There's five calls that have gotten, you know, great acclaim. And then people always say to me, what started this Giambi thing? I don't know. I, it was some kind of internet game. <laughs> if you got to mention his name on the show, but I don't even know where that originated from. I, I really don't know. And then it was like, you uh, know, it the, the was prank, like, like yeah. basically prank callers. Yeah. They'd get through the screeners and then they would yeah. say Giambi. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they, Baba they have Bowie. to get him in the, yeah, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. the conversation. So, I mean, stuff like that, you get, you get that sophomoric stuff, but it's part of the, see, I took so many calls because I'm working by myself for a lot of years after dog left. 
And that was a big challenge, you know, because it's now me by myself and people are like, oh, he's going to fail. He's going to do this, going to that. And we did it actually better than when the dog was there. So I was very proud of that. So, uh, but you're doing a lot of calls then. I used to do calls very rapid fire. I'd go through. Click. They, they couldn't do them fast enough. They'd be <laughs> like, we, most, most shows screen four. My show, they always screened eight. Because what does that mean? I was, they had them waiting. They had eight waiting, oh. not four. Because I'd go through them so fast, bing, 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 bing. And I never pressed the buttons. I would just go. <laughs> and you would bust that chops and oh, dope who waited for four hours. Viciously, viciously. So just getting back to the show, number one, all markets for decades. Right. Probably the only 30 for 30 about broadcasters. Uh, I, I, I don't know if they did any others, but I, you know, it was a great honor to have that, no question. Yeah. I didn't want to do it. And Dog was like, we have to do this. You got to do this. Was Simmons involved in that? Yes. Yes, he was a huge fan, a huge fan of the show. And he used to actually do a takeout, when he used to do a takeout where he would do a whole Mike and the Mayor Dog show that he made up. Doing me. Is he doing the guy him. that you think right now is the closest descendant to what you built, what you created? If you, if you had to like think of, who, I don't who think is the, who is the next. I don't think there's anyone who does exactly what we do. Of course not. I think that Simmons mastered the internet and made a lot of money. Obviously, everywhere he's been, uh, and a lot of enemies, but he's made a lot of money where he's been. And remember, he's a guy who was a writer. He's, you know, related to Jimmy Sports Kimmel guy. and everything else. And, you know, so um, Portnoy with Barstool has hit a nerve. He's not that kind of broadcaster, but he's got what he has, part of what we had. We knew what worked. Yeah. We knew what the audience wanted. We knew what the audience would love. And he does that. Yeah. With, and that's what we had. But one thing that we had, which was a huge advantage, we came along at the perfect time. I mean, everybody wanted us. I mean, they came to us before they created the best damn sports show. They came to us and said, we have to have you. And we said, all right, let's talk. Well, they said, we want a show Monday to Friday. And we said, <laughs> we already do five and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. You want us to do it every night? Right. They're like, it has to be Monday to Friday. And we said, we can't do it. How about two nights a week? And they said, five nights a week. And we said, can't do it. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, when are you supposed to eat and sleep? Right, so we said no. Right. And then they created the best damn sports show. Kornheiser would tell you that part of the interruption, which changed a lot of stuff on television, yeah. came from Mike and the Mad Dog. I mean, he admits that. I mean, Tony's a guy, you know, he's from Long Beach. I'm from Long Beach. He's older. He's a great writer. And he's a guy who was as much a part of the style section in the Washington Post as the sports section. But uh, And he's a very bright guy. But he admits, I created a lot of the stuff from, listen to Mike well, they and they had Mad a two-man show with a... With like a uh, him and Wilmot, not and antagonistic, but they no, went but at edge, they went at it. An edge, yeah, an edge. And, very but then they different. had the video, so they could put the topics up and they on screen. Came at it very differently, yeah, very differently, and that was it. You know, Dog was a unique character, and I knew how to reel him out and reel him in. I knew how to I knew how to play him, and he was very good at letting me play him. So I would know where to take him, and he knew what I was doing. And he was a superb performer in that regard because he knew what his role was, and he would play it. And now there's a dog sense now. He's blown up again. Hey, he has because the the ESPN thing helped him a yeah. lot. That was a very good thing for him. He really needed that because Sirius didn't ever give him the identity he needed. Now ESPN has done that, which I'm happy for. When did you know that podcasts were really a thing? That you said to the station, hey, we got to pay I attention. I fought with them about this, and I said, you guys don't understand what's going on here. Explain to me how you were going to monetize this monster. Yeah. Because it's you're bastardizing our business. Mm -hmm. You're taking away from our show and our sponsors. What are you doing? How are you making money on it? And they could never, while I was there, tell me how to monetize it. And that was their, that's radio's big problem is they've never realized how to play in the podcast world. Were they afraid of killing the golden goose? Like what they took did, them so long? They didn't know what to do with it and they didn't know what to do with the internet. They wanted to use the internet as a promotional tool, but they didn't want to use it as a vehicle. Now they... Well, a lot of those stations make more money off the internet than they make yeah. off their own broadcast. It's just that nobody wants to cannibalize their own business because you have people internally that even if they get podcasts right, there's going to be displacement. There are going to be people who lose their piece of the fiefdom. 
So it's it's Listen, one of the hardest things a company could do is cannibalize itself. Most people don't make any money with podcasts. There's millions of them. There's only two ways to make money. Number one, you have a podcast that gets a gazillion listeners. Now, murder mysteries do real well. The Obama guys did real well yeah. with theirs. There's a handful, Adam Carolla, you know, Joe Rogan. There's a couple of guys. If you don't have that, first of all, you have to have a brand. If you're not a brand, you're dead. It's like one guy in each category. Right. Like, like there's two guys in health. So there's I was Atia a brand. And Simmons Huberman. is a brand. So right. you can go in and do this. Yeah, yeah. So you got to get a company that'll say, hey, I want to own the podcast. And I get paid because Bet Rivers owns the podcast. And they pay me a very good amount of money to do the podcast. So because they want to publicize their product. They want to get people driven to their app for gambling. And that's my job, to drive people to the app and to do that with the podcast. And that's what they do. And that's that's what we do. So you're either going to get it from a company up front or you're going to get it because you have a lot of listeners, which is very rare. I would say 98% of the podcast don't make any money. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. So speaking of, of gambling, what are the leagues supposed to do they're to police what's going on with Otani and Jante Porter, who I've never even heard here's of? Here's what they're doing. They're taking, first of all, the Otani thing, okay? I don't know what happened, and I'm not accusing Otani of anything. I don't know anything about Otani's dealings, gambling, or anything else. But I know a couple of things. And you guys know this too. You're successful business guys. You, nobody who is an interpreter can send eight or nine $500,000 wires out of somebody else's account, okay? We all know that the bank would have been on libel already, all right? There's, you know that if you send a wire, people have to send you passcodes. No, phone call. Phone, phone call. call. Especially yeah. that dollar level. A second person has to 100%. get involved. You know how hard yeah. it is to send a big wire? this person being wire? held hostage? I mean, <laughs> they come wanted on. The, right, right. I mean, this is, a, he, he, first time he said was, I covered the bets. The yeah. second time, I didn't know what happened. That second time was a complete lie. Now, now I, I don't know what's going stolen. on. Now he's saying he's being stolen from. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's not true. He knew. I don't know what his involvement is, but don't tell me he didn't know that those question. were coming out of his account. Do you think it's wise for the LA Dodgers to have a guy who's going to make $700 million uh, be basically coupled up with a guy who's making 85 grand a year? Hey, and Isn't have, that a recipe for larceny? And, and Listen, and have him at poker games yeah. where the buy-in is like two hundred fifty thousand dollars. The guy makes eighty thousand a year. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. He's playing in a poker game with a buy It's two hundred fifty grand. Why can't they pay the? Why can't they pay the interpreter a little bit more and, to protect their seven hundred million dollar asset? And then you wonder. And I think a lot of times Manfred Goodell, who I've had my battles with, they know they're not dumb guys. Okay, so they act like they're naive about gambling. They're not. No bookmaker in the world takes a bet of a hundred or 200 grand from someone he doesn't think can pay it back. Yeah. Nobody does that. So that money was stamped a tani. It wasn't stamped an $85,000 a year interpreter. What about this theory? Um, they're extending that amount of credit to the interpreter because they think it's a gateway to get Otani. No question, but okay. what they get still him? Like wouldn't- Like get him as a client. But they wouldn't want him to go millions into debt because if the guy can't get Otani to pay it back, they're never seeing the money and the guy's going to run to the FBI. Yeah. That's the one thing, which somebody ran to the FBI, okay? Because this guy was under surveillance beforehand. But here's the thing. Baseball's got a headache with Otani. The Dodgers have a huge headache with Otani. And sports, the leagues, have a huge problem. They act like- they want to police their people. And at the same time, they are stuffing the money from gambling in every pocket so fast that they can't make it fast enough. It is the golden goose for them. So we're going to tell a player, a backup player, don't you dare gamble, but everyone else can gamble. And the leagues and the teams can make a gazillion dollars on internet gambling. Give me a break. It's not a system that can work. So what do we do? This wait, is going to keep happening. But don't you think but don't you think it's not asking a lot to tell a guy, "Hey, you're making 2 million you're nobody, but you're making 2 million dollars this year and probably for the next 3 years. Just do us a favor. Don't open the fucking gambling app." Players, 3 years. Players are not the smartest people no, I understand. in the world. And, and not every one of and not every one of them makes a fortune. 
Okay, that's another thing. Not every one of them's making a fortune. Who's now, John Day, who so, is John Dante Porter? What, what is, John, what is I'm looking story? up at John Dante right. Parker Sally right now. Uh, he, you know, everyone in the NBA makes a couple million, so yeah. that, that's beyond the point. But here's the thing. You can police them. The bigger problem they have right now is college. Yeah. They have got to stop the individual player bets in college. No props because for kids. You can't have props in college. They have to be outlawed because there's no way to police them. Are you going to know if a kid in Waco who's averaging 20 at night is taking an envelope and scoring 18 that night? I mean, come on. Or 15 and, and taking a bet? You can't know that. You know, most places, they don't take big college basketball bets anyway because there have been so many places where they've shaved points. A team is, hey, UConn's a 30-point favorite one night. How would you stop somebody from shaving a point, you know, right. and win it by 26? Is so that movie uh, Blue, it's, Blue Chips? It's a big right? problem, yeah. right? It's a big problem. They have to police it in college. In the NFL, in the pros, I think it's much easier to police it, much easier. But it is a huge issue. And at the same time, they're not going to kill the Golden Goose. They are making a ton. And they own some of this stuff. They don't only run it. They own it. Yeah. And it's huge for engagement. And oh. I think I think it's and it's going to get worse. I think it's great because people were going to do these bets anyway. But I think the negative is they haven't yet figured out how do how do we draw this line. You know what the big problem is? The high school kids are betting. Oh yeah, my, that's a big my, problem. My, and they don't. A lot of them don't have money in their betting, and they all. My betting. son's doing prop betting. It's two dollars, but yeah, he's, it's two dollars, and then in. it's twenty dollars, and then it's fifty dollars, and then it's a hundred dollars, and then he comes and says, "Dad, I'm down a thousand, and the guy wants his money." The problem is. It's too easy for those guys to gamble now. It's got to be policed a lot better. And Congress, you know, as soon as they see an easy score where they can look like they're holy in the now and get an easy win, like they did with the steroid issue, they'll do the same thing here with gambling and they'll punch in some serious rules. There's something about this moment in time where we got legalized, uh, we got legalized cannabis for recreational purposes and legalized sports gambling inside of an 18 month period of time basically went from no, 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 to maybe to, to yes. Everything is permissive. To, and now this, the whole economy is is basically based on, on sports gambling. So I, I don't, I guess I- Atani I guess, could put a hole in the sport you if think he so? was dirty. Yeah. If he was dirty. If they, if they have him dead to rights. And I don't know if that, and I'm not saying he bet because I have no idea that he did and I'm not accusing worse him. Worse than 98? Worse than the steroid stuff, you think? Him? If it's would him. Would be- a disaster. Okay. For, a, a PR disaster for baseball. I mean, Pete Rose. It'd be worse. 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 Uh, I want to ask you about the Knicks. Is this, I, I, I get scared saying this out loud. Good. This is my, I think this is my favorite team since like 96. It should be. Okay. Is this your, one of your favorite teams ever? Yeah. Villain over North. I mean, it's a good, it's a, it's a wonderful How, I team. I love these guys. Yeah. And we're getting bridges. I you know, that would be a dream come true. That's the last Infinity Stone. He is so underrated. It is ridiculous. I, I, if that could happen, it would be so it's much set, fun. Seven I mean, first round picks? Oh, it would be. Hey, yeah. listen, we, I'd give them anything. I, really, I would give them anything within reason. As long as they didn't damage the team other than Randall, they can obviously have. Uh, I would give them almost anything as long as I don't break up my core right there. Uh, OG was a very good pickup. He made the team a lot better. Uh Robinson is a great rebounder, so he will be a positive. The way some of these guys have played, like Hartstein and, 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 and McBride. Josh, Josh Hart. And, and even uh, Achua. Yeah. I mean, these guys have played so far over their heads. Mike, I went to a game it's recently. unbelievable. The guy in front of me called Achua the big sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they are so likable. Is Jalen Brunson the most talented player we've had since Patrick Ewing? Mello's more, Mello is more talented. No, um, but talented yeah. like on the team, no, not in the Olympics. He is... The, he is in this era, again, this is a player who came from nowhere to not start him, to superstar him. He is playing, even LeBron said he is now playing on a level that is so high, he has to be recognized. That's scary for a guy who, I got to admit, I always liked him. I loved him at Villanova. I liked him in the pros. I thought he was a a guy would be a 20 player, minute a night player. player, you know, Maybe a nice an backup point guard. Yeah, no, I thought he'd yeah. be a backup point okay. guard, but a good one. Like a guy who played meaningful minutes, he's but a was a backup. He's a superstar. Now he's a Let's superstar. Say it. They're, bl say they're it. blitzing him. Every, every, now, every team is sending is two guys superstar. at him. And that team, here's the thing. The way they're built, 
I don't think in the playoffs where the game changes dramatically, dramatically. I don't think they can compete with Milwaukee and Boston and beat either one. But yeah. I think they can beat anybody else in the East. They could beat Cleveland again, I think. I think they could beat anybody else. And I think they will win a couple of games even against them. But I don't think they'll beat either one of those teams. And I think the team, I think Milwaukee is scary. Mm. They, but Why? They, they, they don't have any weaknesses. They just don't know how to Coach. play yet. Well, I, no, listen, all due Doc respect. Was, what Doc did was terrible. Listen, I like Doc personally. I've played golf with him a lot of times. He's a wonderful guy. But let me tell you something. When you're brought in as a consultant and, and for a young coach to help him and you take his job, that's an ugly look. That is an ugly look. I'm sorry. You were brought in as a consultant to help the kid. And next thing you know, hey, you know what? They want me to coach yeah, the team. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I thought he was a podcaster. I mean, that's a stab <laughs> in the back. I mean, that was, that was an all-time stab in the back. So it's, it really been, it, it's, it's been a long time um, since we've had anybody like Jalen. So this is every Knicks point guard starter since 2009. It's unbelievable. It's an ugly list. Duhan, Raymond Felton, Tony Douglas, Felton again, Pablo Prigioni, Shane Larkin, Jose Calderon, Derek Rose, Raymond Sessions, Trey Burke. Oh my God, my eyes. Alonzo Trier, Alfred Payton, Kemba Walker. The Calderon Holy era shit. was probably the, the, the bottom. It was all so bad with him and Bargnani. It was all so disgusting. And finally, the franchise is in good shape for the first time legitimately in 20 well, years. Well, what they've done is- More. They've done a brilliant job and they made the hot move, which took them up a level. And then they made the OG move and took him up another level. Leon deserves a ton of credit. He's done a brilliant is the, job. Is he like, if you if you had to uh, force rank the factors that have led to this, would you put him one? Or would you put like just all the draft picks no, piled I up? Him, or I put him there. It's I him. think he's done it. I okay. think you got to give him the credit. And he selected, basketball is not about more. It's about the right guy. It's never about more. It's not like... If I take this guy who can score and bring him in, or this star and bring him in, it's going to work. It doesn't work. It's a team. You need the right guy. Hart made them so much tougher. And then he wanted to take him to another level, and OG took him to another yeah. level. And I'm telling you, if Robinson comes back healthy, he will take them to another level because of his offensive rebounding. They have a chance to really have so much fun. I've said to my boys, I've said, hey, the Knicks are going to be – that, that ticket is going to be hotter than I remember when it was the hottest de- ticket in the world. Yeah. Hey, when Riley was there, mm. it was, they were rock stars. That place rocked every night. There was never, you didn't miss a, ge- a game at the Garden. You didn't, we used to go to the Madhouse on Madison in the playoffs, then right back to the Garden. We'd go to every game, Knicks balls, every game, Knicks bases. Hey, you didn't miss a game. When Riles was there, it was must see, must watch. It, they were the biggest stars in this town. We would talk Knicks for four hours. There were times in the last couple of years where I didn't talk Knicks four hours in a year. <laughs> that, that's how bad it got. Well, we're that's back. how big they we're were. Back. They're back. Mike, I tr- so I have a half-season ticket package. They're back. I tried to get, I, I saw my rep the other day. I asked if I could get a follow. She said, probably not. She hey, said, get in line. And and the tickets aren't cheap. Yeah. No, they aren't cheap. So getting back to Leon and credit he deserves. Executives, are they, they have a lot of sunk costs, Right. If they draft a guy, they're married to them. He got rid of Obi, uh, IQ, who was a fan favorite, and RJ. And look what he's turned them into. The, I can't hey, believe it. You know, when he made the OG move, most people were not Fans did it. not like that. They didn't like it. And I'm, yeah. and I'm like on a podcast saying, are you guys paying attention? This guy fits like a glove. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is like, same thing with Hawk. Most when fans Hawk weren't came, watching him. I, listen, I, I know the Villanova guys very well. Uh, Jay Wright's a close friend. I was around those teams. I know those teams. Hart is the per, was the perfect guy. And the Garden took it to it right away. They knew immediately, right away. Immediately. Right away. The first time he went to stands for a ball, they knew right yep. away. And that's what they hadn't had in so long. Hey, it's a, it's a, it's a fun thing. And building a basketball team to the top is really hard because you need exquisite chemistry or that guy. You have to luck into a Luka Doncic or a freak or someone like that. He's or got a Jaylen blossom. Brunson? Or look what Br- <laughs> they, Brunson has developed into that kind of player, which is crazy. crazy. You know, Doncic knew it. He was furious when he left. Furious. Uh, A-Rod. Holy shit, what a story. Have you ever seen anything like this? Uh, I texted, A-Rod had texted me a couple times last week and we text back and forth. And I said, sorry you lost the team. 
because I saw the story, bullets can come out that the A-Rod thing is dead. And he said, don't believe it. Let's set this up for the audience. This is the Minnesota Timberwolves. The owner is the richest man in Minnesota, uh, Glenn Taylor. He uh, effectively has presided over a team that couldn't get to the playoffs right. if if their lives depended on it. He's had talent. He's had uh, some bad luck, but he's just not a great owner. Like like flat out. He's right. just and I think he probably knows it. And he got tired of it. And he got tired 84. of it. So so 2021 comes along. Uh, a Rod and who's his who's his primary partner? Mark Laurie. Yeah. Mark Laurie. Yeah. And then they get some private equity well, backing. Like Carlisle Group, which they yeah. didn't like maybe where that money was coming from, because you know it comes from a lot of different places with the Carlisle sure. Group. Sure. Yeah. So but but so they but so they strike a deal in 2021 right. that they're gonna pay on a schedule. Oh, like it's a condo. Right. <laughs> like it's a pre-construction building. And right. the number. The and, number's right. important. And one and a half billion dollars. One and a half right. billion. And right. now the, I think the floor for an NBA franchise is hey, three. Hey, it's a home run. I told him, you got to get the team. I said, getting the team is, un I said, getting involved at that level of ownership as a player is so unbelievable. And, you know, during this time, Tom Brady has now become the first owner. There's only been two NFL players who were owners. George Hallis, who was a player. Yeah. As it, it, when the team was worth 2,500 bucks. And Jerry Richardson, who left the Colts and started Hardee's and then bought yeah. a team later on. So, uh, the, so he, but, he bought so, Carolina, but he bought them as a rich man years later because he started the Hardee's franchises and he was a player with the Colts in the 50s. Those are the only two who have ever, ever owned NFL teams, ex-players. Now, Brady has been approved to own part of the well, Raiders. Well, Der Derek Jeter got private equity backers to take the raise. Like it's, now it's, but in football, now they want it's never, but football's on a different level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now you have Brady in as an owner, which means that money just multiplies. It, it's, it, yeah. he knows that. And the, the smart player knows now, you don't want to be a broadcaster. You don't want to be a coach. You want to be an owner. Yeah. You want to be an owner. If you're a LeBron James or if you're a LeBron James or a Brady, you want to be an owner because then the money goes from, 20 million to 50 million. You know, look what Jordan did. Jordan made himself with no money down. And a terrible team. <laughs> made himself <laughs> almost a billion dollars. So I was I was going through the Timberwolves draft picks and Mikhail was at the helm for a long time. I mean, obviously famously, they took Ricky Rubio and Johnny Flynn over Steph. I mean, just, they took Derek Williams second, Wesley Johnson fourth, just a run of disasters. Right. And the owner, who the last time they won a playoff series was 2004. 2004! Uh, so he has sellers remorse. So they now, sold it for a billion and a half. It's so now he's three. saying they missed. So so the now story he's saying is I'm keeping it because he knows he gave it to. Well, him he's saying they, they missed the payment, which sounds like bullshit. bullshit. Right. And and, a Rod says it's not over. Now that's what he texts me, and he said, "Just wait, it's not over." Well, he well, should go. He should go to entangled? war right now. Right. That's what they own forty percent of the team. What are they going right. to do? He ha he gets to keep that, but the point is, he says the other part's not over. That's what he texts me. So I don't know what that and, means. A Rod and Lori built like a, a nice owners type box. The Glenn Taylor said you can't go there anymore. Like yeah. it's it's gonna get ugly. It's it gonna get is. ugly. It's it's gonna get ugly, and 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 they will clean that up very quickly. Who's that? You think the courts? The, the league? league? No, the, the league. league. Yeah, the owner. Yeah. Yeah. The commissioner yeah. will clean that up. Yeah. See, in every league, there's always an inner sanctum where there's two or three owners who really run the league, and they work with the commissioner, and they're the power. Who's that okay. in the NBA? Well, in the NBA, it has changed a lot in the last couple of years because you've had so much turnover. It's got to be Lakeham. It, it's, it's now different, guys, and it's very unsettled now because you've had so much change. Like in the old days, it was Mo Modell, Roselle, and Klein. They're the ones who developed, with Mara always being the guy who could placate anybody and get any consensus done, like get Hallis to agree to split the money even though he had Chicago. He didn't want to split the money. The Giants said, yes, we'll give everybody the same TV money. Hallis said, I'm in Chicago. I'm not giving them my money. I'm not giving Green Bay my money. But Hallis, uh, willing to matter who's the hero of having the league be as successful as it is because he got Hallis to agree. Um, in the old days, though, the guys who made the TV contracts and took them into the real world were Klein and Modell with Roselle, that threesome. They were the ones that took the NFL to the moon. There's always strong guys. And Kraft has been very important in the league. And Jerry Jones has been a rebel, but he's also been smart sometimes in, 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 uh, when he's not playing for himself, which he often is. Uh, but there's always guys in the league. And the league always, with ownership, likes to have peace. They don't like to not have peace. Look how they got this guy from the Clippers out. Right. That took 10 minutes. Right. They okay. get guys out quickly. Are you, are you surprised Belichick didn't get a job, Vrabel too, for that matter? 
Um, I think Belichick could have got a job, but he wasn't going to take a job under the wrong circumstances where I think he needed to have, if not complete control, at least veto power over certain things. He wasn't going to have some guy he didn't like. See, in Atlanta, he and Rich McKay have never liked each other. So that was a problem. They were keeping Rich McKay. I didn't see how that was going to work with him and Rich McKay there. Okay. Now, they had, ne they had clashed many, many times. Um, here's the thing. How would you like to be a guy on the hot seat this year with Belichick sitting there? Uh, yeah. Wanting the coach. What, ready. That's a disaster. <laughs> I mean, if you're Dable, if you're anybody, the first call is going to Belichick now. If you're an owner, would you be excited to give Belichick the keys? I mean, obviously, as a coach, yes, as a GM, I think, he's I think terrible. He, listen, Belichick and I have had our issues, and we're not friends, and we never have been. But he has got, listen, he's not a quarterback guy. He doesn't find, he's, everyone has a weakness. His weakness is he does not pick quarterbacks well. Or anyone. Although he let Dick Rabin convince him to draft Tom Brady. His drafts have been horrendous. Right. He, though, can still build a defense, build a special team, and as long as he has somebody inventive, like he had Bill O'Brien, who came up with the two tight end thing with Gronkowski and, and Aaron Hernandez, Hernandez um, mm -hmm. as long as they have guys like that and Dick Rabin to pick Tom Brady, um, he would still do very well, I think. And I don't know what will happen with the Giants. Everyone thinks it's a foregone conclusion. It's not. Which part? What is? That he would be the next coach uh -huh. in the Giants. Here's the thing. He and John Mara are very close. They're very close. But the Tishes don't have any relationship to Belichick. He left the same year they bought into the team. They have no relationship with him. And they don't want to have a guy who's close with the other owner and have to pay him a lot of money to come in as owner. So remember, Belichick's not coming cheap. So... I don't know if that's a foregone conclusion. I think he'll get a job next year. Uh, he won't take a job in season. He'll wait now this year. Supposedly, he's writing a book, and ESPN is offering him carte blanche to do yeah. anything he wants. They'll give him a ton of money to do basically has some very of the little. Shine, have some of the shine come off of him since he started coaching without Brady? I think the shine will come back when you look at the overall record and realize how, how unbelievable he was. Yeah. Listen, Don Shula didn't have a great finish. Um, guys, no one wins without players. And he got caught without players. Now, he deserves some of the blame for that. But he can still coach. I, there's no question about him coaching. You don't know that Mac is going to be what he turned to. It's, it's, to me, knowing nothing, it seems really hard if even the best people in, in the business can't select a quarterback with any reliability. Well, he did really, also. Really hard. He also has a thing for certain types of players. He, you know, he's the guy who brought in Randy Moss. Yeah, but he didn't bring in any explosiveness to this team in recent years. You have to have, like, the Giants are going to draft a wide receiver. I, I was going to ask you. I think that's. So I, I would think they're going to for sure. There's so many good ones. Harrison will never last to six. If he lasts to six, to the Giants second. should throw the party yeah, yeah. of all time because <laughs> he's the second coming of Larry Fitzgerald. He will be an all-pro multiple times, okay? Now, he's not the burner that some of these other guys are where he catches the ball and he's gone, but he will still catch 100 balls and 15 touchdowns and every We haven't year. had a guy like that since Odell. But neighbors and the kid out of Washington, Odunze, are tremendous talents. Giants can probably have either one of them. They will probably take one. How about the Jets? They made moves. They finally took the, I mean, I, I wanted them to take the tight end, uh, the uh, tackle so badly. I mean, to get Tyron Smith, who's a, yes, he's been injured, but he's a Hall of Fame player when he's healthy. Last year, he was the number one pass blocker in the league, and he played over 900 snaps. If he stays healthy, they're going to be in great shape. So giving him the money they gave him was a home run. I would still, if I'm the Giants, if I'm the Jets, at 10, I would absolutely draft an offensive lineman. I would not draft a tight end. I know the you tight gotta, end's very protect, good. You got to protect this guy. I got to draft one more, and then I can get a good receiver on the second round. And they just brought a good receiver in. And you know what? I can shape tight ends. I got to take another tackle if I'm the Jets. This is the best offseason, and I can't remember one. This is the most interesting draft that I can ever remember since the days of the Eli draft where you didn't know what where you was going to land even the night before. And you had Hostetler and everything else. Oh, yeah. Uh, not Haas, uh, you had, and you had Hostetler in the same draft. Kurt Warner with it. Uh, uh, the bottom line is there are so many quarterbacks and so many teams need quarterbacks. What is Sean Payton going to do? You know, what are the Giants going to do? 
who's going to take all these quarterbacks? How high is the Michigan quarterback going? Some people have them high, going as high as two. I mean, so this thing is wild right now with the quarterbacks. Most quarterback in openings in, I don't know, pick a number. You 20 could years? have five quarterbacks go in the first 12 And picks. start. Five quarterbacks. Yeah. That's a lot. What? Why do the Jets, uh, why is Robert Sala still their coach? Right now, he lucked out because if Aaron wasn't there, he wouldn't be the coach. He'd be gone. He would have gotten fired last year. He's the coach because Aaron wants him to be the coach. And Aaron's doing whatever he wants there. As long as he's there, Aaron he runs didn't take, everything. He didn't take the blame. It's more Jets bad luck. He, Salah is a is a awful, hideous Say it coach. louder. Hideous. <laughs> he is not a bad defensive coordinator. And his defense plays terrifically well. But here's his thing. He's got the same disease that so many defensive coordinators have. After the game, they lose, and he says, hey, we shut that quarterback down. You lost, you moron. You're a head coach. What do you care if your defense shut the quarterback down? Yeah. You still lost the game, and you lose almost every game. <laughs> First, you got to win games. Don't worry about shutting down they aesthetically. Win, they won three last year? Hey, he bragged That's about it. shutting <laughs> down big quarterbacks instead of he doesn't yeah. win any games. The object when you're the head coach is to win the game, not to stop the other team on defense. Or if you're the Jets, it's to get a draft pick. You sound like Herm Edwards. <laughs> oh, it's re hey, he's hideous. Okay, Rex Ryan had the same problem. They're more interested sometimes in the performance of the defense to prove that they outsmarted the offense and outsmarted the quarterback than they are with the win. Do you miss being able to? Because you pulled no punches. Do you miss being able to tell the coaches this to their to their face or on the radio? Well, you know. I had a lot of love hate with coaches. I mean, I, I I had a lot of great relationships with them. I had a lot of bad relationships with them. I mean, how many refused to come back on? A lot. I mean, you know, Buddy Harrelson quit us, um, and he just passed away. So God rest his soul. But um, he was. I mean, he harbored, and so did Tom Siva. They he hated uh, Dog and myself because he felt we were, he loved Buddy and he felt we were mean to Buddy. Buddy was just a hideous manager. He was a wonderful, captivating player who overachieved, but he was a hideous manager. Jeff Tolberg was a hideous manager. When they're a hideous manager, you got to say so. You know, Bruce Coslett accused us of getting him fired, and I said, I've never gotten a coach fired in my life. You know, when I got power, when I get a guy who's eleven and five fired, okay. The guy's five and ten, or five and eleven. He got himself fired. Yeah, the radio, the radio doesn't get a, a winning coach fired. No. What, do, what do you make of the criticisms about the way uh, Tom Thibodeau ends games for for the Knicks? Uh, do you think that's a liability in the postseason? He sometimes is inflexible. Okay. Again, he's a defensive. It's hard for him sometimes. Again. A lot of times the superb defensive coaches have trouble breaking the defensive mindset and coaching the entire, and seeing the entire picture and coaching the entire team. And a lot of them fall into that more than offensive coaches do. Uh, it's funny, you know, the public is so fickle. For years, I had guys call me up and say, you protect Jay Wright, he's your friend. The guy never wins the big one. Well, what happened? He won the big one, then he won the big one, then he won the big one. You know. Andy Reid, they used to kill Andy Reid. Andy Philly. came on with me because he hated the guys in Philadelphia. And Andy say, I only do your show because you have a brain. And he hated the guys in Philadelphia because they were so rough on him. They lost big games. They lost title games. They lost the one Super Bowl he played in. You know not what now? Andy Reid stayed around long enough to prove, hey, you get there, you get the right mix. And you win, and you win. And now Andy Reid is one of the all-time geniuses. Yeah. That's what happens. Thibodeau needs a clipboard guy like Teron Liu to draw plays at the end of the game. He's going to make his own decisions, though. That's the thing. You know what I mean? He's going to... He's going to... Uh, he, has Mc, he has McBride, who's six feet right. tall, guarding uh, he doesn't, SGA. He the doesn't the see some things he should see. Yeah. Overall, he's a very good coach. But he has some shortcomings. The guy who... Who doesn't? Well, Small Street doesn't. <laughs> Spolster is an, right, he's an incredible fine. coach. Incre incredible coach. Meaning what? Like with the talent he has, just, what he's able to do with it. Every year. Brilliant. Yeah. Utterly brilliant. All right. So, Mike, before we get out, let's get out of here. I'm curious. Favorite sports movies? I have a very, first of all, I love movies. So I have a very diverse group. I'm not going to give you the typical, you know, I weepy at Field of Dreams. I don't even like Field of Dreams. <laughs> oh, uh, I'll take. Okay. Now. Uh, best one ever, 
Rocky Two, not one. Rocky Ooh, Two. Ooh, I'm with you. Rocky Two. After Rocky Two, it's a cartoon. Okay, three, four, five, and Rocky Balboa should be burned. Wait, what do you okay? like about is it like Godfather Two to you? Like Godfather Two, De Niro was unbelievable. Yeah, I liked it when it wasn't as good as one because you couldn't take your eyes off Brando. Yeah. When Brando was on the screen, people wondered about Brando. He's a weirdo. He's this. Brando <laughs> was so gifted. Yeah. You couldn't take your but eyes off But why was two, of him. like, why was two better than one in the Rocky series the way that some people because loved Godfather? Because I too? loved how they beat him up early. Yeah. To the point where even Adrian said no. And he said, Adrian, I never asked you to stop being a woman. Don't yeah. ask me to stop being a man. Yeah. And then she said, win. Well, that's one of my that's favorite scenes in any movie ever. When they played at the garden. That's she, no, she comes out of the coma. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and says, I want you to do one thing for me. Yeah. Win. Yeah. And that's it. And you knew he was going to win. That's even better than Rocky 1. And Rocky 1 was a classic. Hoosiers is a great movie. I love Hoosiers. I have to watch that again. Okay. Now I'm going to give you some weird ones. Body and Soul, John, John Garfield and Lily Palmer, a boxing movie. If you've never seen it, see it about the corruption in boxing. Great movie, and I'm a big John Garfield guy. John Garfield, Lily Palmer, what era, Body when and is Soul, that from? 1939. Okay, now, <laughs> okay, I'll right give on you that. another one. <laughs> Winning team, Doris Day and Ronald Reagan, Grover oh, Cleveland, wow. Alexander. Watch the last 10 minutes and tell me you aren't cheering your ass off what's, in that what's movie. Sport is, what's baseball. baseball. Grover Cleveland, Alexander. Okay. Came back. He was run out of baseball for being a drunk. Came back. And struck out Tony Lazari with the bags full in the seventh inning to stop the last threat and win. Oh, it's a true story. See, he, he won game two mm. as an old man. He won game six as an old man. And he went to him in game seven in the bullpen and brought him back. Yeah. And he struck out Lazari and finished the game. Is Ronald true Reagan, story. Ronald Reagan is playing him? Ronald Reagan. Doris oh, wow. Day and Ronald Reagan. Oh, wow. Great movie. Okay. And then My All-American which is a story about Freddie Steinmark, okay. who is a guy who was an overachiever who went to Texas, started as a sophomore. He only started two sophomores. Dow Royal only started two sophomores in his whole life. Tommy Nobis is one of the all-time great linebackers and Freddie Steinmark. And Freddie Steinmark as a senior got bone cancer and they cut his leg off. And they still have, he died a year later. He still, they have a plaque to him that they touch before every game. Mm. Great movie, it's called My All-American. Came out two years ago, was done by Angelo, who did the Hoosiers. He did that movie. And then the other one would be Jim Thorpe All American with Burt Lancaster. Oh, yeah. Another great old movie. Great. That one I'm movie. that one I'm aware of. Great old movie. You know what I, I like? I love the old ones. Too. I like Uncut Gems. <laughs> uh well, you're a sports, I did that. that's a hey. sports gambling hey. movie. That's another genre. Hey, I love that. I spent one Starring day. Mike Francis. I spent one day with Adam. One day. And you know, the Safety Brothers said, I got a role for you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go in the kitchen and I want you to yell at the cook just That's like you yell at the cook. That's the dumbest bet I've ever heard. <laughs> I want you to yell at him like you'd yell at a cooler. I said, I got it. No problem. One take. Mike, did you have fun on the show today? Absolutely, guys. Now, what do you think, Josh? What do you think? Uh, what are we rolling with now? NVIDIA? What are, what are we buying? M I'm, st I'm still long NVIDIA. MU, microtechnology. I've taken a ride on Micron technology. I think you and I are both in NVIDIA for the same period of time. You I've never left, NVIDIA. right? I've been, in, I've been in NVIDIA since it was 23 with some shares, but I, I bought a lot okay. in the hundreds, yeah. and I've still have, I haven't sold any. Well, Mike, I got to ask, what's the exit strategy, or is there one I don't NVIDIA. have one for NVIDIA until they tell me until I see a bad quarter or I see them, I wake up and they take 100 points off it. If they do that, I might have it and wait. Yeah. I haven't done it. And every time it's gone down, it's come back up. Mm -hmm. And I think unless they have a bad quarter and it doesn't look like they're going to, if somebody catches them and builds a chip that can compete with them, everything I read on the stuff I can read, layman stuff, that I can understand, and I don't understand all of it, but it seems like they still have a moat that is very, very wide. Nobody, nobody's even arguing ASML if there's a moat. ASML does, yeah, yeah. they do. Yeah. And I owned SMCI for a ride and got out at about Super 800. Good for you. Yeah. I got out, I bought it about 400, I got out about 800, and I hadn't been back in since. I got lucky. I got on the ride because I noticed it was mirroring NVIDIA every day. So I bought some and I got lucky with it. So Just you, blind luck, blind luck. You don't want to sell NVIDIA and be Glenn Taylor. I don't want to sell NVIDIA because I still think there's more upside until I see that there's 
I, I have a couple of cores. Like I never sell Amazon. I always have Amazon. I'm not, I don't own Google. I've actually paired some Apple, which I have to admit, I, I, in the last year, I paired a little Apple. I've always had Apple. Stock acts like shit right now. It does. It's yeah. too big. Yeah. It's like moving a battleship. They're not yeah. growing. Yeah. They're and not so growing. Amazon's probably going to face the same thing, but they haven't yet. And it seems like they've bought into some AI stuff and they have an idea. Sports. The one I missed that was easy was Microsoft, and I never bought any. Mike, we I had a guy on. It. We had a guy on uh, last last week. Uh, manages fifty billion dollar uh, technology uh, growth equity portfolio. He is fifteen percent Amazon, which is so far overweight the benchmark. Wow. And he's saying he thinks he thinks it's the best of the giant. It's the best one for this year, and the main reason, the guy running it was the guy who built AWS. Right. They are basically shedding expenses faster than most people give them credit for, like laying off tons of people, cutting costs, and a lot of this AI stuff is going to accrue to their benefit. Well, I, so, I, hey, it sounds good to me. And I got lucky with Micron. I saw a thing where that it was like 85, yeah, yeah. and the guy yeah. said, hey, I'm telling you, they are going to rock it. And I said, hey, I'll buy some. You know, it was 85, wasn't bad. So I bought some right before earnings and it took all, it, it, it's, it's gone Explosive. up. It's like 120 something yeah. already. So it's done well. So uh, that's, those are lucky. Uh, have I had a real bad one recently? Um, I got uh, MDB beat me up and went down. What is that? After is that Mongo? I bought it. Mongo? Mongo, yeah. You bought it for a joke? No, no, I actually, <laughs> I, I, you know, saw it as one of those companies and I bought it at the wrong time and then I got out because I got whipsawed on oh, it. Oh, you're in, yeah. you're in, uh, you're in Uber with me. I'm in Uber for the Don't beginning. Don't sell it. I've never sold uh, right. Uber. I still right. have it. I bought it at 23 and I still have it. I haven't sold any shares. I don't get, I don't give investment advice on the you, podcast. You I'm talking me directly Uber. to Mike. No. <laughs> I'm talking directly to Mike. I think that stock's a hundred bucks hey. easily. Don't sell jo it. The reason I own that stock is you, Josh. The last time I saw you, I said, Josh, give me a stock. And you said, I love Uber. And it was not the last time we met. It was two times ago. Yeah, the yeah. stock was in the 20s. And you said, it's a $100 stock then. Still think so. You told me. And I've never sold it. And it's, what, 78, something like that? I feel like I am the I'm, That's it. I'm the goat at what I do. That's My, it. Hey. Dude, you're the, you are the very best. I, I, would, I would keep you going forever, but- <laughs> We're going to dinner now. That's it. I'm going to go see Nelson at uh, Hunt and Fish. Let's go. Thank good you, to see you so you much for Continue doing this. Good luck. Thanks. Hey, good uh, to see you. Thank everybody, you. make sure you're listening to uh, Mike Francesa's podcast. He is the Pope. He is the GOAT. Everything you've heard is true, as long as it's the good things. Yeah. Uh, we, we look up to you. We idolize you. you. We we appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I watch you guys all the time. All, all right. right. Hey, everybody. Do all the listening and the liking and the subscribing, and we will see you soon. Take it easy. Bye.